Buenas tardes. Good evening, dear friends. Good evening, and thank you for your kind presence to this first conference, part of the cycle organized by Dr. Achu Carro on astrophysics and cosmology, science by the cosmos, science in the cosmos. First of all, I'd like to give a recognition to the director of the BVA Foundation, Professor Rafael Pardo Avellaneda. I'd like, like to thank Dr. Ana Achucarro, organizer of the conferences, because it's a great opportunity to introduce Dr. Samuel Chao Chung Ting from the MIT. And it's a great privilege to uh, introduce briefly the subject of a lecture. I'd like to give a total recognition to BBVA Foundation for this formidable endeavor in favor of science, more specifically in favor of physics. Since a long time ago, allow me to mention the importance of Frontiers of Knowledge Awards, awards at the Spanish Royal Society of Physics and Mathematics, as well as the conferences organized. This is a fifth cycle and also what is related to elementary particle physics uh, jointly with CERN. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for this magnificent job. And I'd like to add, and uh, let's, let's take it as an example. Professor Teng, back in 76, got the award, Nobel Prize Award, for the discovery of J particle at the Brookhaven National Lab in the United States. I had the privilege of working there since 69 till 72. And for the first time, I was lucky enough to attend a conference and lectures given by Professor Teng, where he presented important results obtained in the photoproduction of vector mesons produced at very interesting experiments at the German lab DESI in Hamburg. The discovery of J particle in November 74, and at the same time, the discovery of the same particle at the SLAC in California, uh, which was denominated PSI by the research under the leadership of Professor Burton Richter. They both got the award uh, from the Royal Academy of Sciences in Sweden, the Nobel Prize, and it was a milestone trying to discover the uh, structure of the matter. The discovery stated the existence of a fourth constituent, fundamental constituent of matter, quark C, and strengthened the idea that quarks was a, an important idea, the idea introduced by Gelman and Zweig in 74. At the same time, that did consolidate the uh, so-called quarks model, one of the milestones of the standard model of particles and interactions jointly with the unification and breakage of the electroweak symmetry, asymptotic freedom, and the understanding of the strong nuclear forces. Prior to that, Professor Ting had participated in a very interesting experiment conducted back in 65 at the National Lab based in Brookhaven, where they discovered the antideuteron, the antiparticle of it's a nucleus of the deuterium atom. In 32, Anderson had discovered the anti-electron, and in 60, 70, sorry, 55 and, six and 56, Segre and Chamberlain and Cork had discovered the antiproton and antineutron, respectively. But the idea of extending the notion of antimatter to nuclear systems composed by several nucleons was not evident at that time and was not unanimously accepted at the time. This is why the discovery was so important. And I'd like to give a token recognition to Professor for this. After the discovery of the J particle, Professor Ting continued his discovery at the positron and electron collider, Petra collider, at DESI, 
the lab Hamburg, then the Mark J experiment was one of the four experiments in 79 discovering the agent propagating the nuclear strong interaction, the gluon. The detailed study of the processes was very important for the consolidation of quantum chromodynamics, the theory describing the processes mediated by strong interactions. And the same experiment, the observation of a charge asymmetry and the muon pair resulting from the annihilation of electron positrons was one of the most important validations of the standard electroweak model, the wamber glashow salam electroweak standard model. In 81, they decided to start constructing the Bay Collider, the LEP, for studying the properties of bosons, vector boson Z and W plus minus. Professor Ting put jointly a great team for constructing the experiment, which was the L3, one of the four milestones since 83, since uh, 83 till 2000, they kept on working. And uh, the heritage of the experimental LEP program is, without any doubt, extraordinary. It's fantastic because an LEP that measured with one out of 10 Thousand, they measured the mass of bosom Z and the number of light neutrons. They determined the upper limits for the size of quarks and leptons. They determined the dependence of the constant that was predicted by the asymptotic freedom theory. They put at stake the electroweak forces, confirming the nature mechanical quantum underlying characteristics that allowed to characterize in 1992 the region of masses where it should become materialized. And at the end of the 90s, the scale where the bosom of Higgs was discovered, and it was at the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, and confirmed. At the beginning of the 90s, Professor Tim proposed the idea of constructing the magnetic spectrometer with better characteristics for studying cosmic radiation, giving priority to the electrically charged component at the International Space Station, uh, free of the atmosphere characteristics. One initiative that had been considered without success before by prestigious researchers. In spite of the very many technical difficulties of all sorts, uh, sometimes due to the accident of the space shuttle, Columbia Space Shuttle in 2003 and the accident, so people took it negatively. And then mainly thanks to the determination and uh, of our lecture, it was possible. And the 16th of May, 2011, the last uh, uh, space shuttle took the eye AMS tool up to the International Space Shuttle and 48 hours afterwards we started getting the data towards the control centers based in the United States and Europe that since then has been ongoing without any interruption. Universally accepted is the fact that the study of electromagnetic component of cosmic radiation, neutral cosmic radiation, has been the fundamental tool for gathering knowledge on the composition and and evolution of the universe, the discovery of cosmic radiation, microwave cosmic radiation asymmetries allowed us to determine the composition and matter and energy of the universe, establish that it is the flatness as well as the acceleration and the expansion of the universe with a new form of matter and energy, the dark matter, dark energies, to discover pulsars, binary pulsars, and to understand gravitational waves etc. Other ways of neutral cosmic radiation, neutrinos, had allowed us to analyze the enigma of a deficit of atmospheric neutrinos and to establish the mass uh, characteristic of neutrinos, another observation of gravitational waves, another important message for studying the universe. Cosmic radiation the cosmic microwave discovered and with important consequences at the beginning till the end of the last century 
was very important for elementary particles and high energy physics, but it's still important for studying with accuracy aspects that are fundamental in the case of modern physics. To try to understand the nature of dark matter, looking for the traces of the primordial cosmic antimatter, to understand the origin of cosmic rays, to understand confinement and propagation within our galaxy, or to get about, get information about new phenomena are some of the challenges that we have to cope in the field of basic knowledge and physics. AMS experiment that's going to be presented by our guest, Professor Samuel Ting, is a very important tool to try to answer some of the fascinating pending questions. Since 81, thanks to the splendid initiative proposed by the late Antonio Rubio, a group of researchers from the former Nuclear Energy Board, now the CMAT. We've been working with Professor Ting firstly at the Mark J experiment in Desi, then working at the L3 LEP experiment at CERN and since 97, uh, part of the AMS project at the International Space Station. Thanks to Professor Ting at the CMAT, we have a group of researchers, competitive group of researchers, skillful with uh, scientific talent and technical skills that are acknowledged internationally with the capacity to go forward towards industrial projects. Finally, Professor Ting, during his very long career, successful career, fantastic career, hard work in person, he's got lots of awards. One of the awards in 2004 was the acknowledgement as a foreign correspondent of the Royal Academy of Sciences, Physics and Natural Sciences. Thank you, Sam, for what you have achieved in fundamental physics and for your continued support and advice to the CIMAT group. For us, this has been of the greatest importance to become better scientists and to be in the position of doing better science. Now, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. It is certain for me to give public lectures. Uh, once a while I do that at MIT when they are in fundraising mood. And uh, I'm very honored to be invited by both of you. Uh, so what I would like to do is to share with you an experiment on the International Space Station. The International Space Station from this place to this place is 110 meters. From here to here is 80 meters. So it's like a football field. It weighs 420 tons. The construction cost is about $100 billion. So you are an economist, and so this is very costly, no in immediate financial benefits. So in, on the space station, which is 420 kilometers above the Earth, rotating around the Earth every 93 minutes. There are six astronauts living on board, and on there, there's one experiment with the Manuel Aguilar, Javier Perdugo, Carlos Mania, and many others from CMR, and people from MIT and many other countries work. So I want to share with you why we do this experiment, what we have found so far. Manuel Aguilar discussed the development of accelerators. The first accelerator, the 1612, where Galileo did a very simple experiment 
found gravitation. The energy is very low. This is the largest accelerator, LHC, at extremely high energy. And the purpose is to study the fundamental building blocks of nature. This accelerator still exists, and you can visit them. So this is a picture of AMS inside the space shuttle. It was launched from Kennedy Space Center on May 16, 2011. It has two solid rockets, each weight 1,000 kilograms. Within 123 seconds, the two solid rockets burned off, and so it falls apart because you want to exhaust the fuel. Fuel is also weight. You want to remove them as quickly as possible. And then there are 800 tons of liquid oxygen and hydrogen will last for eight more minutes, and then it's in space. And this part is falling into Indian Ocean. And so after a short time, then it's in space. This is not a cheap experiment. Somebody has given me this cartoon, which said, look, instead of sending your detector into space, send money to space is much cheaper. So the question is, why you do these things? The problem today, which challenge us, are immense. The question is, how can these challenges be met with the tools we have developed? I would like to read a short passage to you. Humanity is being ravaged by disease. Doctors are powerless against it. Pollution is everywhere. Men and women die daily in senseless ethnic conflicts. Homelessness is rampant. People can't read. Children are being killed on the street. And this was quoted in Europe in 1350 not too far from what you read, some of the issues today. Yet from this period of despair, destruction, and disillusionment sprang the greatest period of hope, new ideas, and creative expression. The Renaissance was born in Italy and spread throughout Europe, transforming how people look at the world and their place in it. Scientists re-examined all the ideas about the nature of the universe inherited from ancient Greeks and Romans. Modern science, or the understanding of natural phenomena using experimental techniques, was established during that time. In this century, we enjoyed unprecedented advancement in technological development, such as in the field of communication, computers, transportation, healthcare, and so forth, which have had dramatic effect on the quality of all our lives. What is often forgotten is that the foundation of this achievement was laid down some time ago by scientists who were driven by intellectual curiosity and not by economic concerns. So here is my little graph on fundamental science and society. So this is the physics in 1900s. This is 1930s. And this is what we have today. In 1900s, we study classical physics. Mechanics, thermodynamics, 
optics leading to today's television and aircraft. In the 30s, we will study quantum mechanics and atomic physics, leading to today IT, laser, your cell phone, your internet. In the 40s, what is considered fundamental physics, and perhaps not useful, a nuclear physics. Now is used in reactors and isotopes. So accelerators goes to smaller, smaller, smaller distances. On the opposite side, in the 30s, we study stars, study sun, now used for navigation, your little GPS, and time navigation. The experiment CMR and I are doing is going to larger, larger distances. So the physics now have extremely small distances and extremely large distances. So frontier science at extremely small distances, of course, at accelerators. And uh, you're all familiar with uh, the large accelerator. And this accelerator's byproduct is the invention of WWW and discovered many, many particles. From these studies, we know an atom outside is electrons. Inside the atom is the nucleus. Inside the nucleus are particles. Inside the particle are quarks. And this is after hundreds of years of study found there. So, as Professor Aguilar said, I've had uh, many years of collaboration with Spanish scientists right, and started July 81 with uh, the late Juan Antonio Rubio and Javier Bodugo, Carlos Mania, and many others. And these uh, pictures of them and you now do not recognize them. They have changed a little bit. So, as Professor Aguilar has elegantly mentioned, one of the Spanish accomplishments was work on the discovery of gluons. Gluon is the carrier of forces between quarks. Why you don't see quark? Because they're bound together by gluons. In nature, there are three types of forces. One is gravitation. Gravitational wave, after 400 years, finally has been observed. The electric weak are carried by light rays, and these two other particles. Nuclear forces is carried by gluons. So this is a fairly important discovery. And this was carried out in the world's first large electron positron experiment. And in this place, we built this detector and discovered the gluon jet. The second Spanish accomplishment is the experiment called L3. It lasts for many years. Many physicists from many countries and with a strong participation from Spain. The idea is very simple. You have a very large accelerator. You accelerate electrons, positrons. Positron is the antimatter of electron. So when matter and antimatter collide, it produces energy and produce high temperature. If you have a 100 billion electron volt electron and 100 billion electron volt positron collide, you produce the temperature 400 billion times the surface of the sun. The temperature of the light bulb, the, the voltage of light bulb is 220 volts. Imagine you have 100 billion electron volt, so the energy is enormous. 
And so this means in the laboratory, in a controlled funded way, you produce the first billion, billion, billions of a second of the universe. So if the universe comes from Big Bang, you try to reach in this region. People believe the universe comes from Big Bang, right? and so gradually after 14 billion years, we have all of you and myself. Now the question is, what happened at the beginning? So what is the purpose of this experiment? I just mentioned, we now know the world is made up of point-like particles, six type of quarks, and something we call leptons, actually electrons. That means the ordinary electron, the electron from space, which is 200 times heavier, and the electron in the nucleus, 4,000 times heavier, the ordinary electron. And it's neutral, chargeless partners called neutrinos. So for a simple experimentalist, you can ask some questions. The first question is, how many types of electrons are there? Why there are only three? How large are the electrons? Can electrons be divided into smaller particles? Similarly, you can ask, how many quarks are there? Why there are only six? Why there are not more? What is the size of the quark? Can quark be divided into smaller particles? If you will ask a theorist, and they will, they will tell you they know all the answers. But if you don't measure, if you don't check, you will never know. So this was the experiment where the Spanish and uh, groups of other people together build, and this is one of the magnets. It's built in this way, different particles go through different, leave different traces. So these are the detectors, which with the very large detectors, and these are mostly made in CMR and at MIT. It's a very difficult device, very, very large, but very, very precise. So this is the front page of Scientific America this describe one of the events. There was, in 20 years, 300 papers, about this thick, but in physics, the fundamental things can always be described in a few sentences. The result of the 300 papers can be summarized as follows. In the universe, there are actually only three kind of electrons. Electron we know, electron from space, electron in the nucleus. There are only six types of quarks to the energy that is available. And more important, electrons and quarks has no size. The radius is less than 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Less than is not equal to. 10 to the minus 17 is a very, very small number. If you were to close your eye to think about it, we use electricity every day, but we seem we not be able to measure the size of the electrons. This 300 papers have 300 results. They are in excellent agreement with the standard model with the mass of the Higgs limit larger than this. This is unfortunate because when your results agree with the theory, what you learn is very limited. It's only when the, your results disagree with the theory, you learn something. So let me now 
talk about this detector in space and the uh, Manuel Aguilar, Javier Berdugo, and many others work on this experiment, made very important contributions. What is science on a space station? And this can be easily visualized by realize there are only two kinds of cosmic ray traveling through space. There are neutral cosmic rays, light rays, and neutrinos. And this has been studied for hundreds of years. Then there are charged cosmic rays. Because it carries a charge, it has a mass. Because it has mass, it's absorbed in Earth's atmosphere. And so to measure its original property, you have to go to space. Because it carries a charge, you need a magnet. Because only in the magnetic field, positive go one way, negative go another way. Now, put a magnet in space is somewhat difficult. Everybody remember the magnetic compass, and one end will point to the north, the other end will point to the south. So if you put a large magnet on the space station, the space station in no time will lose control. And so finally, we figure out a way to design a magnet that does not rotate in space. So a magnetic spectrometer like AMS on the space station, ISS means space station, is a unique way to provide precision, long-term measurement of high-energy cosmic rays. Together with us, there are very interesting experiments. This is an experiment studying neutrinos at South Pole. The experiment is located 1.4 kilometer under the ice, has a volume of one cubic kilometer. In there, after 1.4 kilometer, there are 5,000 detectors. And this, their control room, floated on the South Pole to detect neutrinos from outer space. There's another experiment used the fact when a very high energy par charged particle goes through the atmosphere, you interact with the atmosphere, you produce many secondary particles. And so if you put detectors, measure the secondary particle, you can find the energy of the original particle. In order to do that, in order to measure very high energy, you need a detector which is located in Argentina, a rather large area. This is the city of Paris, and this is the size of the detector. It's 10 times larger than the city of Paris. Measure extremely high energy particle. Of course, you will not know what is the property what you study, because everything has broke apart. So what is this experiment on the space station? It is the first precision particle physics detector deployed in space to measure charge cosmically and study their characteristics. The cost by NASA's counting for the detector is not cheap. It's about $2 billion. And mostly come from Europe and Asia. The U.S. contribution is to use the space shuttle to deliver this detector to space and use the space station. So AMS is now explore, exploring new physics not possible to do on Earth. It is an international collaboration with major contribution from NASA, from CMAT, CDTI, from German Space Agency, Chinese Space Agency, 
European Space Agency, Italian Space Agency. And there are many countries, many institutes, and many physicists. Recently, Turkey and Brazil has also joined us. Because it is a very costly experiment, so the government hesitated to proceed. And finally, the Congress of the United States in 2008 unanimously passed a law called HR 2028, uh, <coughs> uh, HR 6063, asked the government to provide an additional flight to deliver the alpha magnetic spectrometer and other scientific equipment and payloads to the International Space Station. So this is the first experiment required the support of the United States Congress because it was unanimously approved by both houses, so the administration will have to follow. Once it's over two-thirds, it becomes a law. So this is a trillion electron volt spectrometer. Spectrometer is a device to identify different particles and their energy. Cosmic rays are characterized by their charge, namely their position on the periodic table. And something called rigidity, namely energy. I mean, rigidity is just a, a form people use, momentum per unit charge. You can think of it as a charge or energy. So this is a very precise detector. Nobody has ever done this before. Most of people think it cannot be done. And uh, finally, it's there. On the top is a transition detector. It's per, on the left side, its purpose is to identify electrons and positrons. The electrons and positrons go through the detector, called TRD, it will give out a signal. And then there are nine layers marked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, are silicon detectors measure the track of the charge. And then at the end, it's called electromagnetic colorimeter. A colorimeter is something very simply understood. When a particle goes through a detector, if the detector is very thick, it soon loses all its energy, and you measure the energy. It's an energy measurement. And then there are two banks of a Tama fly detector. One, you can see, called Tama fly. One in the top, one in the bottom, which measures the direction of cosmic rays. And then there's a magnet, measure the sign of the charge. And the one thing that was done, very important thing, done in Spain, is called ring image turn of counter. Its purpose is to measure the nuclear charge and energy. If you look at this picture, you realize the charge, namely its position on the periodic table, and its momentum or energy are measured independently by four detectors. This is for many reasons. The first of which, is once in space, if something goes wrong, you cannot send a graduate student to repair it. So you better make sure there's a redundancy. The second thing, it gives you an intercheck, intercalibration. So the magnet, 10 magnets were built. 
because nobody has put a magnet in space. So when we build a magnet, we build 10 of them. The last three are full-size magnet to understand whether the magnet will fall apart when you do the acceleration. The second is you test the magnet to find out at what point you will fall apart. Because if you put a magnet on a space shuttle and your magnet fall apart, it will not be very good because we kill the, all the astronauts. And the third is the flight magnet. The magnet was made in China. That is because the best permanent magnet material is from Indo Mongolia, which at this moment is part of China. Transition radiation detector was mostly done in Germany. It identifies electron positron by something called transition radiation and nuclei by energy loss. And this is down in Aachen. This is why I know so close to Leiden. These are the silicon detector. There are nine planes, 200,000 channels, measure the coordinate to one-tenth of your hair. It's a large international collaboration. And this is a, a large view of silicon detector. Coordinate resolution is 10 microns. The ring image chunk of counter, otherwise known as rich, is to measure nuclear charge and velocity. Velocity means energy to an accuracy of one part in a thousand. So these three graphs show the measurement of aluminum, measurement of calcium, measurement of iron at extremely high energies in space. And these are mostly done in Spain. And this detector has 10,000 photosensors to identify nuclei and their charge. And this is CMR group who made this possible. So we also had the excellent support from CRISA. So the detector it's the largest of its kind ever put in space. It's five meter by four meter by three meter, weight seven and a half tons. This is the only experiment where the missile designers of China and missile designers of Taiwan work together. Normally, they do not. They hardly talk to each other. So during the shuttle launch, the Spanish Minister of Science and Innovation come for the Kennedy come to the Kennedy Space Center. So on May 19th, AMS was installed on the space station. And you can see two astronauts, one is there, another in the front. When they come out, it's always a pair for safety reasons. After it's installed at 5 o'clock, after four hours of checking, fortunately, nothing went wrong. So we began to collect data. I would say we're rather lucky. So in five years, we have collected 80 billion cosmic rays. And this is much more than all the cosmic rays collected in the last century worldwide. So let me share with you a few physics results. Because it is a very precise particle physics detector, so the data analysis was always carried out by two, by at least two international teams. And the ones 
put in red, Mr. Badugo, and Carlos Mania, Jorge Casals, and Carlos Delgado, Alberto Oliva are from Spain. The first question we would ask is the search for the origin of dark matter. We know 90% of the universe is not observable. Because you cannot see it, that's why you call it dark matter. A galaxy, as seen by the telescope, is on the left. But if you could see the other 90%, the galaxy will be on the right. Even though you cannot see it, but the collision of dark matter produces energy. Energy will go to ordinary matter, such as positrons, positively charged electrons. This axis of positrons can be accurately measured by AMS. So the axis positron is described as positron fraction, namely positron divided by the total number of electron positrons. So collision of ordinary cosmic rays will produce this green curve. And because they're in space, they're ordinary cosmic rays. But if you have dark matter, you will produce much more than collision of ordinary cosmic rays. And this red curve will correspond to you have dark matter with energies of different energies. You will see excess. So a deviation from collision of ordinary cosmic ray of the blue of the green curve means something new has happened. So this is our first result. This result was published in 2013. Sure enough, the red point are our measurement. Our measurement does not agree with the green curve. The more fit to the blue curve. So this get everybody excited. There's long articles in New York Times, in Wall Street Journal, in Spanish newspaper, in German newspaper, and many, many newspapers. And claiming incorrectly that we have seen dark matter. So a year later, we made much more precise measurement. And this time, based on 11 million events. If you look at this right, red curve, you will think the following. At very low energy, the red curve and the green curve must agree with each other. Otherwise, your measurement has no meaning. And second, when the rate increases, it must agree with the theory. And then there must be a point when the energy stops increasing. Stop increasing is because dark matter has a finite mass. When you have a finite mass, you cannot produce infinite energy positrons. And then you have to look how quickly it falls down. A curve has normally three or four characteristics. And so let us look what we have seen. We indeed found the red point is our measurement as function of energy in billion electron volt. At very low energies, the measurement is agreed with collision of cosmic rays. But when the energy increases, it suddenly deviates from collision of cosmic rays. So the deviation from traditional understanding of collision cosmic rays shows something new has happened. Now, what is this? What, is it? what has happened? Our increase will show 
is different from collision of cosmic rays, and it agrees with pulsars and with dark matter. The energy is not high enough to distinguish the excess positron is from pulsars. Pulsar is a rotating neutron star, and because you have a strong magnetic field, a light ray going to the magnetic field produces the electron positron pair. And so that is another possibility. And so what the newspaper claim, not correct. We have, we have results consistent with dark matter. We cannot rule out other possibility. Now the question is, where is the energy beyond which it ceases to increase? The lower curve is measured positron fraction. From this measurement, you can measure the slope. And so you will find out the slope increases, and then it's flat, and then decreases. It reaches zero at 300 billion electron volt. When the slope reaches zero, means you no longer increase. So you have now found the highest point, it increases. Again, many newspapers, many media are very excited, incorrectly. So it will take us some time to finish the measurement of the last part. To find how quickly it falls down, it will take five more years. In five more years, we will know if it's pulsars, will be the blue curve. If it's dark matter, will be this uh, semi-red curve. So it will take some more years. The important thing is the data agrees with dark matter prediction or the measurement, but this does not prove you have found dark matter. You need a few more years to distinguish why this come from pulsars, from a new, new type of pulsars, or from dark matter. The next measurement is the electron and positron spectra. Spectra is energy, the number of particles produce as function of energy. The blue is the electron data, the red is positron data. You look at this curve, the errors are enormous. But these were the best measurement in the last century with balloons and with sat satellites. Nevertheless, the data has large errors, and if you look at this data, they are inconsistent with each other. Because the data has so large errors, it has created many, many theoretical models. This is the AMS measurement. You look at this data, you will see the data clearly exhibit the different behavior of electrons and positrons, both in their magnitude, the magnitude for electron is on the left, for positron on the right, and their energy dependence. You would think electron and positron are similar things, at high energy, they should be the same, but they are not. This is the measurement of protons before AMS. Protons are the most abundant cosmic rays. And these were the best measurement over the last 100 years. Nevertheless, the data have large errors and do not agree with each other. This is the measurement of protons based on 300 million protons to very, very high energy. And this Measurement is to an accuracy of 1% because it's so difficult to measure. So there are four groups to do this, the CMR group, 
the MIT group, and there's a group from France and a group from Taiwan to do this. Only when the four group agrees with each other to 1%, then we publish the data. What is this group? What does this data mean? The blue shade is the traditional understanding. This is the traditional understanding, traditional assumption. The data, the red points, agrees with that until here. After this point, the data moves, and so you have unexpected new contribution. Shows the traditional assumption is not correct. This is the measurement of helium before AMS. Helium nuclei are the most abundant cosmic rays and mostly produced in supernova explosions. And these are the best measurement over the last 100 years. And you can see the arrow between them are very large. This is our measurement based on 50 million events, again, by four international groups. If you look at this measurement, the data agrees with traditional assumption up to a point. After this energy, the data goes up. So this is unexpected. And so, this is the first result on the measurement of the first few elements on the periodic table. The important thing is the measured rate, different from traditional understanding, at about the same energy. So this new observation contradicts to the current understanding of cosmic ray behavior. Both proton, helium, and lithium. So these, all these results have changed the understanding of cosmic rays. Again, many, many articles appear, try to explain them. So the latest measurement of positron fraction, the behavior of flux of electrons, positrons, protons, helium, and nuclei is providing new, precise, and unexpected information. The results have changed our understanding of cosmos. AMS will be on the space station till 2024 or 2028, and in the next few years, the first most important thing is to measure to highest energies to understand what is the true nature of dark matter. And we will also look at the existence of antimatter and continue to search for new phenomena. If you remember what I said, everything we measure contradicts with previous understanding, both theoretically and experimentally. What, is, what do you mean, existence of antimatter in the universe? The Big Bang origin of the universe requires matter and antimatter to be equally abundant at the very hot beginning. Because that's the simplest way you could have come from a vacuum. So the universe now is 14 billion years old, have this, this podium, have all of you. Another question is, where is the universe made out of antimatter? We know antimatter, heavy antimatter, does not exist in our galaxy. Because if it exists in our galaxy, it collect with matter, will produce sharp X-rays. The fact we do not see the sharp X-ray, sharp energy, means it does not exist in our galaxy. But the universe has 100, billion, 100 million galaxies. So the purpose for us 
to look to every one of them. And until near the age of observable universe. So we know a universe have helium, carbon, nuclei, I already described. The question is, is it possible? Quite far away, there's the anti-universe of anti-helium and anti-carbon. How do you detect antimatter? Cosmic antimatter cannot be detected on Earth because matter and antimatter will annihilate each other in the atmosphere. Matter and antimatter has opposite electric charge, so you need a magnet to distinguish positive from negative. To do that, the first thing you do is to make sure your detector can measure all the elements in the periodic table in space. Now we have mapped out the elements in periodic space, periodic table. This we know is on the ground, and the first question is, does it exist in space? Is your detector sensitive enough to look for that? So that's it's a calibration, make sure you have confidence in your detector. So next question is, how do you whether there are particles with negative charge? These are all positive charge nuclei. The experimental work on antimatter in the universe, because it was so difficult, not possible to put a magnet in space, and because the limited balloon experiment. So in 1967, a very well-known Russian physicist, Andrei Sakharov, proposed maybe antimatter universe does not exist. In order for it not exist, you have two, two assumptions. The first, the symmetry principle, one of the fundamental principles in physics Maybe it's wrong in a major way. And second thing, it's the most abundant cosmic ray, protons, actually do not live forever, it actually decays. If these two assumptions is fulfilled, then you have a way to explain why antimatter disappeared. Over the last 50 years, many, many experiments, including the experiment at CERN, including a huge underground experiment in Japan. By the way, this is a boat. And this is an underground cave. People fear the water, the boat goes up. Eventually, you get out. So nobody, after the 50 years, has found a strong symmetry breaking or proton decays. So no explanation found for the absence of antimatter. So experimentally, there's no reason antimatter should not exist. What my Spanish colleague and myself and others want to do is forget about this. Let us do a very sensitive look whether this exists or not. So cosmos is the ultimate laboratory. Cosmic rays can be observed at energies higher than any accelerator. But the most exciting objective of AMS is to probe the unknown, to search for phenomena which exist in nature we have not imagined nor had the tool to discover. In fact, so far, all I have presented to you fit into that category. So let me go back to what I said at the beginning, the relationship between fundamental science and society. This pyramid has grown with new application at its end. And the fundamental research continually widen in spaces, go to larger, larger distance and smaller, smaller distance. So the, ba the role of basic research implies it finds itself 
always in the outermost corner of the pyramid. Hence, it's times, sometimes viewed as being remote from daily life. Only after some time, when application developed and the public become familiar with new phenomena, does the value of basic research become understood. So to summarize, the prime motivation for basic research is our curiosity, the innate passion to learn something new and obtain a deeper understanding of natural phenomena. Results of basic scientific research, so difficult to predict in advance, have had a profound effect on society. Thank you.